this stone, this stone is for all those who were and are affected by Typhoon Mawar in the North Pacific. Thousands were, were and are without power and water in Guam, and thousands have had to evacuate in the Philippines and Japan. These superstorms are, as we know, are becoming more frequent with climate change. May we show resilience in the face of them. This stone is for those affected by the horrific railway accident in India two days ago. This disaster killed almost 300 people and injured nearly a thousand more in a crowded country that is heavily dependent on rail transportation. Our hearts are with the ones who have to carry on and make sense of a senseless tragedy. A little closer to home, Kari Matheson's brother Eric passed away on May 15th, joining Kari's mother and father in the beyond. We're very sorry for your loss, Kari, especially so soon after your father's passing. Laura writes that her father, Riley's papa, passed away after a long battle with cancer. Her family is in Mississippi. This one is a joy and a concern from Caroline and Stacy. Our young adult children are on a road trip. <laughs> Helene wishes us to know that her granddaughter, Rayleigh, graduates from high school in Raleigh next week and has been signed to track and field at UNCU, UNCW, I can read. Congratulations. A joy from Anonymous, we have a new adopted a small rescue beagle. Her name is Tiny and I'm already smitten. Oh, that's from, oh, that's from Susan. Susan is not anonymous. Also, two of our members received honors at Carteret Community College this last spring. Maya Pope was named to the president's list, and Wes to the vice president's list. Congratulations to Maya and Wes. And some of you may know that our friend Laura Upchurch moved back to Raleigh last week, and last Sunday was her last day with us. She wrote a note to us to say, I want to say thank you to UCF for helping me feel welcome in your congregation and a special thank you to Karen Baggett for inviting me here. I will miss the great fellowship. And last but not least, Pat Curley writes, welcome to Kate from Ukraine. I invite everyone now to please join me in the spirit of prayer. To that great spirit of the universe, whose name we do not know, who goes by many names, our hearts are so full today. Our hearts are full with joy, joy that Kate is here with us, that so many are here with us, joy that we have new pets, joy at graduations, at awards, joy at new family members, so many joys, and also griefs and also sorrows. Even as we sit with our own joys, we also sit with the knowledge that there are those in Guam without power and water, that there are those in India who are missing their loved ones. Joys and sorrows woven fine, joys and concerns always side by side, like our adult children when they're on road trips. How do we make sense of this? How do we sit with it? Life is a mystery that we are always striving to untangle. And as we sit and untangle these feelings within ourselves, let us feel that we are in a room full of others who are doing the same. That we breathe together, that we grieve together, that we celebrate together. Let us never forget that in this life, 
none of us arrive alone, none of us leave alone, and that nothing in the middle needs to be born alone either. Amen, and blessed be. I invite everyone now to sing with me our blessing song as we bless our little ones and anyone else indeed who wants to go to the other building and do an activity together. It's a blessing you were born and it matters what you do, what you know. meditation, contemplation, in what I sometimes call an almost silence. True silence is probably impossible to achieve, but we can sit in the almost silence and reflect upon that. This time is yours to use however you wish. You can notice your breathing. You can work on your shopping list. You can do some mindfulness meditation. It's up to you. It's just a moment that's yours in a busy, busy week that frequently feels like it's not yours. I'm Tom Wentworth, and I'll be offering today's reflection. And I want to begin uh, this morning by repeating our chalice lighting words. Again, they were called People of Memory by Reverend Kimberly and Tom Zach Carlson. <clears throat> we are a people of memory. As inheritors of our ancestors' legacy, we hold their stories tenderly gleaning wisdom from diverse journeys, united in hope for the future, guide us to trust in love as we kindle this flame together. Closer. Okay, thank you. So I repeat these words because they state a profound truth about human beings and many other, probably most other living things we are a people of memory. Now, most of us have probably heard the old saying that we are the product of nature and nurture. And this pretty well sums it up. <clears throat> 
However, for today's reflection, I'd like to modify this old saying as follows. We are the product of the memories given to us by nature and nurture. So let me explain. First, we are in part the product of the genetic memory bequeathed to us by our ancestors. As we developed into human beings from the moment of conception, we followed a set of instructions encoded in our DNA. These instructions passed on to us by those ancestors who themselves were successful in surviving and reproducing, directed our physical development, and also left us with many deeply rooted behaviors the very ones that our ancestors themselves found beneficial. But wait, there's more. We humans have another vast dimension of memory. It's called nurture. Nurture is our amazing ability to supplement and alter our hardwired behaviors through learning and reflection on the broader consequences of those behaviors for other humans and indeed, as we like to say, as you use, the interdependent web of all existence. So why this Dr. Wentworth scholarly lecture on nature and nurture, you're asking yourselves? Well, let me get right to the point. Today, we are exploring the question of why humans are such ardent helpers. We just celebrated helping a few minutes ago. So some helping can be explained on evolutionary grounds. I think I gave you the background for that. For example, we help our kin in many, many ways, especially our close kin, like our children and our parents. There's a theory called the selfish gene that really expects this of us because anything we do to promote the success of our close kin promotes the perpetuation of our own genes because we share those genes with our kin. But we are also compulsive helpers of people unrelated to us and whom we may have never met before. So why would we volunteer to work long hours in a soup kitchen or in an extreme case, dash into a burning building to rescue a child that we've never seen before and is probably not closely related to us? Well, some scientists believe that our instinct to help all others is deeply rooted again in our evolutionary history. So now we're back to our genes. Much of our evolutionary history as we became humans was spent in small tribal groups where we <laughs> Okay. <laughs> where we knew and were close kin to everyone in those little tribal groups. They were, they were pretty inbred. But helping these other people in these small groups perpetuated our genes because we were related to all of them. And we still carry this genetic imprint according to this theory, despite the fact that today our communities are not these small tribal groups but rather massive communities, even global communities, made up of others who are not closely related to us. But wait, there's more, right? What's the other side of the equation? Nature, nurture. So social scientists would be quick to point out that much of our helping nature is acquired through learning and experience. Most of us are taught and learn well that helping is the right thing to do. We learn this from our parents, in our schools, and in our faith communities, like this one. The themes of 
do unto others and love one another reverberate through all of human history as the pinnacles of moral and ethical truths. So, thus as we reflect on helping today, let's keep in mind that helping is indeed one of the most deeply rooted elements of being human, of our nature and our nurture. So, we are indeed a people of memory. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> I always like to have Tom's scientific perspective. I majored in English. So now you're going to get what I do, which is storytelling. So this part, you can maybe try to picture in your, in your minds, like, like you're listening to a podcast or something. So it's after midnight on April 14th. The year is, 20, the year is 1912. So it's technically April 15th, 1912, because it's after midnight. And Harold Cottam, 21 years old, is the telegraph operator, because you used telegraph back then, it's 1912, what did we not have? We did not have internet, you know. <clears throat> He's the telegraph operator on the RMS Carpathia, a passenger steamship bound for what was then called Austria-Hungary and what is now called Croatia. His shift just ended, it's, it's past midnight, but you know, he's decided to leave the transmitter on just for the heck of it while he gets ready for bed. I mean, this is, I mean, he's, he's 21, you know, telegraph is maybe kind of, kind of like, it's kind of like a job and kind of like a toy. And that's when he hears messages from Cape Cod, Massachusetts, stating, you know, we, we have messages for the ship, the Titanic, and we can't get through. And Cottam thinks, what the heck, <clears throat> you know, I'll, I'll radio the Titanic and, and let him know that Cape Cod has messages for him. Maybe they're just not paying attention or something. So he radios the Titanic, and I trust you all know about the Titanic. <laughs> so the Titanic sends a distress message back saying, we have struck an iceberg, we are sinking, and we need immediate help. So at that point, Cottam's like, this is above my pay grade. And he goes and he wakes up the captain. Captain Arthur Henry Rostrin. And Rostrin, you know, he's just been woken up, right? He gets out of bed. He, he orders that they're going to turn the ship around. They're going to make it. They're, they're going to make for the Titanic's coordinates. And he says to Cottam, now, are you sure that, you, that that was a distress signal? You're absolutely certain. And Cottam's like, yes, I am absolutely certain that was a distress signal. <clears throat> and Rostrin says, okay. And now he does what some people might think was completely insane and what some people might think was the only reasonable thing to do and was probably a little bit of both. So Rostrin woke everybody up. He ordered every stoker, every engineer to work, you know, shoveling coal, you know, and he posted extra watches on the deck to look for icebergs because remember, they're heading into an ice field because what did the Titanic hit? An iceberg. So he's heading into an ice field. Remember, it's also the middle of the night. He ordered that all of the ship's heat and hot water be cut off to divert everything they possibly could to the engine. Because you have to remember, it's 1912. The Carpathia is a steamship. It runs on steam. The Carpathia, by the way, was also not meant to go fast. She's a passenger liner. She was meant to be comfortable. So her top speed was 14 knots. I had to convert this because I am not a boat person, as you know. So that's a little over 16 miles per hour. That night, she clocked almost 17 and a half because they were pushing her so hard. Supposedly, the chief engineer put his hat over the steam gauge so that nobody, including him, could see how far the needle was in the red. <laughs> so can you imagine? It's the middle of the night. It's dark. It's cold. You are headed into an ice field that has just sunk the Titanic, which had just made all the news, claiming that she was an unsinkable ship. And you are doing so not just in top speed, but in excess of top speed, which ships are not really meant to handle. They're not really meant to go over the speed that they're supposed to go at. 
So Captain Rostron was well within his rights to proceed slowly and cautiously. I mean, if you go back a couple hours, Harold Cotton was also well within his right to just go to bed and not pass on any messages to the Titanic. But because Cotton decided to be helpful, he did radio the Titanic. And because Rostron decided he could not live with himself if he did not do everything he could, he pushed the Carpathia past her limits. And it wasn't just the captain and her crew, either. All the passengers were awake by now, because, you know, if you have a ship going three knots over what it's supposed to go, that makes some noise. <clears throat> and they'd learned what was going on, and so now all the passengers are doing everything they can. So they've given up their own clothes and blankets. They've set up, you know, one of the dining rooms as a triage center. They're making hot drinks. Yes, they saved some steam power to make hot drinks, because they figured the survivors were going to be cold. So Cottom had radioed the Titanic that they would be there within four hours. They made it in three. Who knows what difference that extra hour made, we don't know. In any case, they were a full five hours before any other ship made it. So they spent four hours lifting survivors out of the water because they were all in lifeboats by then. The Titanic had sunk. And they took on all 706 of them. There are photographs of the passengers Yep, there we go. Helping the Titanic survivors, giving them blankets, listening to their stories. Harold Cottom, our intrepid 21-year-old telegraph operator, stayed awake for over 48 hours, working with the Titanic's junior signal operator, Harold Bride, who worked even though, by the way, his feet were badly injured. Um, they'd been, like, crushed in a lifeboat accident. To relay official news about the survivors to shore. They did not talk to journalists. They almost certainly received bribes to talk to journalists, but captain's orders. Captain Rostron wanted some dignity for the survivors. He, want, he didn't want a circus for them just yet. I love that story. It's an amazing story. Uh, I was a little worried that I might like get a little choked up while I was telling it, because I get a little choked up thinking about it, because I think it's a, it's a story about human nature. <clears throat> That despite what you might think, despite what you see on the news about how divided people are, how hateful people are, I think that much of the time, maybe most of the time, we want to be good. We want to be helpful. Now, I don't know why that is, whether it's nature or nurture, like Tom said, I'm not a scientist. What I know is when the chips are down, you can see people helping people. That's when you can see people being people. How many of you read Lord of the Flies? For, it was required reading for me in high school. I don't know if it's required reading anymore. So that's William Golding's novel about a class of British schoolboys who become stranded on a desert island and they descend into total savagery, right? There's actually a real life Lord of the Flies. Yeah, so that's six Tongan teenagers who ran away from their boarding school in 1965. They stole a fishing boat and ended up stranded on an uninhabited island where they survived on bananas, wild taro, fish, and seabirds. They divided their chores into shifts. They took, work, they took turns, cooking, gardening, guard duty. Uh, the two oldest boys became leaders, one spiritual and the other practical. <clears throat> And they, as you can see, they made a sort of guitar for themselves, and they composed music. They composed five original songs while they were stranded on this island for 15 months until they were finally rescued by a passing boater. But maybe you're saying, oh, that was people back then. People are worse now. I don't know. Are we? You know, so look at the earthquake in Turkey and Syria from just last year. Well, actually, it was earlier this year. There was an astounding international response to that. Workers and volunteers from the United States and the United Kingdom and Malaysia and Mexico and Russia and Argentina and more coming together to help find survivors and help people recover. Or there are the stories that came out of the terrible blizzard in Buffalo that happened this last winter. Craig Elston, that's him, sheltered 50 people in his barbershop. Jay Wythe broke into a school and sheltered 20 people there, and also two dogs, as you can see. I'm sure that y'all have your own stories about Hurricane Florence. People want 
to be helpful. There are reasons or obstacles sometimes to actually being helpful. Sometimes we're not helpful because we're scared or distracted or we're far away from the places that need our help so we feel like we can't do anything because it's happening on the other side of the world. But I do believe that we want to be helpful. It's human nature, I think, to want to be helpful, to want to come together. Sometimes it doesn't get expressed, but we want. We know that the world is a cold, dark, and fearful place, and the only thing that makes it less so is when we help each other. We want also to dwell on negatives and fears because that is also human nature, and that was an instinct that served us well when we lived in small tribes in caves, and we always had to be on the lookout for danger, for saber-toothed cats and poisonous berries and venomous snakes. That was when it was really, really helpful to focus on and remember bad things, because you could avoid them and stay alive. And today, that means it's easy to focus on stories about active shooters and fascists and insurrectionists and climate change and think that there is no good left in this world. Might as well throw in the towel because there is no hope. Well, maybe there was no hope when the Carpathia set off through the ice fields to help the Titanic, knowing it would take them four hours to get there, but doggone it, they did it anyway. Remember that Unitarianism began as a reaction to Calvinism. Calvinism preached the idea that humans were inherently sinful and required the grace of God to be forgiven, and the Unitarians disagreed. They believed that humans are inherently good. Bad things do happen in the world. I'm not saying they don't. There are bad actors in the world. People do bad things. We see it every day. What I'm saying is what Unitarian minister Theodore Parker once said in 1853. He said, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The ark is a long one. My eye reaches but a little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by the experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience. But from what I see, I am sure it bends toward justice. Things refuse to be mismanaged long. It requires work on our part to bend that moral arc of the universe. And indeed, you may recall that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. went on to paraphrase that quote when he talked about the arc of the universe bending toward justice. We have to be the ones to stoke the engines, to break up the work into shifts, to open the barbershop, to break into the school, to donate money. That moral arc of the universe does not bend by itself. That is not nature. But it does bend. And it's because we want it to bend. Because people want to be good. People want good things to happen. People want to be kind and helpful and generous. We just need to remind people that that is what we want and that we are the ones who must express it. Amen. Let it be so. And I invite everyone now to remain seated while we sing our next hymn, number 1058, Be Hours of Religion. We will sing it three times too. We find...
the Unitarian Coastal Fellowship is a community of helpers. We help to grow this community and benefit the wider community that we serve through generously sharing of our time, talent, and treasure. Building and maintaining this loving community also requires your contributions of treasure, and we hope that you will now help us in this respect. So I invite the ushers forward to collect today's offering. Thank you. I invite everyone to please join me in blessing this offering with hymn number 402 from You I Receive. We'll sing it twice through. Please join me in reading the words on the screen behind me as we extinguish our flames. We extinguish not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And now on Espanol, extinguimos este llama Pero no la luz de la verdad, el calor de comunidad, o el fuego de nuestro compromiso. Estos los llevaremos en el corazón hasta que estemos juntos otra vez. And now, please rise as you are willing and able for our closing hymn, which is number 131 in our gray hymnal, Love Will Guide Us.
ourselves. While bad things happen every day, good things happen also. So go forth, and in the next week, be a good thing. Do a good thing.